Hi, and welcome back to uh, Let's Do Brunch. I'm here with David McMillan. You guys might know him from such restaurants as Joe Beef, Le Vin Papillon, and Liverpool House. We're here in um, St. Henry, and we're off to have brunch at a uh, very uh, vintage diner called uh, The Green Spot on uh, Notre Dame. David is well known for having all of his businesses here um, in this neighborhood, basically, and I just wanted to know why. What is it about um, this neighborhood, St. Henry, Little Burgundy, that you uh, that just, you love so much? There's still a ton of original characters and <laughs> old buildings and, like, even this place, Depaner Vautour, diamonds in the rough, you know, that could be cleaned up, turned back into Depaners or little things like that. This is very old school. Yeah, man. You know, <laughs> if you look at old vintage photography of, like, this area, this neighborhood, you'll see pictures of this Depaner with old Molson, India Pale Ale signs. Like, even look at that that Coca-Cola side. And that's all that me and you put together. You know, like, for real. That biz that's been hanging there since before I was born. Even, like, look, guys that renovate buildings like this, you know, you'd have never thought, like, a, a red brick, like, you know, that's a working class, like, cigarette factory worker's little cottage. And now it's, like, beautifully cleaned up, modern, with this little extension. I love it. It's gorgeous. I love it down here. You know, before you guys, and, and there were others as well, and, and there was, I think, a concerted effort by the city to... To, uh, to spruce it up, um, you know, it was it was pretty down on its heels, man. You didn't often come down to this. When I opened Joe Beef, every building across the street was boarded up with plywood. There was uh, rampant drug use in the park behind the restaurant. Uh, but it was like the, the greatest thing because, you know, uh, we didn't even get chefs from New York City would come up 10 years ago to Joe Beef and they would go, I'm more scared in front at Joe Beef that I'm anywhere in Manhattan, and I go, yeah, like you know, but now, yeah, but now it's now it's now it's cool. You're one of my favorite people to follow on social media. Oh, thank you. Because you, it seems to me that in the in the industry that you're in, you seem to have a higher level of self awareness than some of the other folks. You're not in there entirely for, for self-promotion. In fact, from time to time, you say things that have gotten you some flack, but the self-promotional aspect of, of social media is... Gross. Is, 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 that what you, is that how you'd call it? Do you feel uncomfortable doing it? I won't do it. I, I like social media, but I like to have fun with it. I think it's a, it's a fun medium. I like to post interesting pictures that interest me. I'm not only interested by food. I'm interested by nature, by art, by, you know, landscape paintings, by buildings, cool stuff. I like cool stuff, so I post that stuff. I don't follow a lot of the people that post only food. There's, there's weird, like, OCD <laughs> aspects to working 12 hours in the kitchen and then posting every plate you make. I've, I've had people in the restaurant show up with mini tripods, okay, and a, and a little flash and they have like a camera on the table and they press a button and it takes pictures and then they check the picture on their iPhone. Like I've seen like complicated setups. And but right away then I know that these are people that I don't want to ever meet. <laughs> you know? I was just like, what's wrong with you? When you reach that level of stature, do you worry about things like what people say about it on social media? Somebody goes to Joe Beef and say, Man, I had a really shitty meal. Yeah, for sure that. You know, a lot of people tell me that they had a great meal. You know, the, moral, the majority of people tell me they had a great meal. But there is, I know that I, there's a margin of error. I served 350 meals last night. I guarantee you that 30 people thought it was meh. You know, they didn't love it. But that's, you know. Every dentist doesn't knock it out of the park, and, you know, like, every doctor doesn't make, you know, it's not, has a hundred percent diagnostic rating, uh, you know, I'm sure that you've dropped the ball on a few, like, I phoned in a few columns, you, you see what I'm saying? Is it tough, is it tough to be? A restaurant owner in, in Montreal? Objectively. Yeah, it's fucking very hard. It's a dumb business. My accountant says, my accountant goes like, you should turn your restaurant into an art gallery and apply for Canada Council grants because being an, a conceptual artist makes more sense than running the business that you're running. 
Wow. Yeah. There's a price to going after being a a top 20 restaurant. You know, there's a price to that. You have to, the garden costs money, irrigation costs money, the trout pond costs money. Uh, frivolous, frivolously having a party every night and being generous with alcohol to my guests costs money. But I'm happy though. Don't get me wrong. The, 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 the natural question then is, why don't you? turn your restaurant into a conceptual art gallery and get a Canada Council grant. Like, why do you keep doing the restaurants? That's all I know. I'm not educated. Uh, um, I started working in kitchens when I was very young. Uh, I think I was loud. I was fast. Uh, I got good at it. Uh, eventually, I put the hours in over the years. So having, having been in the restaurant business as long as you've been and having started from the bottom and reached the stature that you've reached, are you good at spotting 20-something-year-old kid who comes to start work for you at Liverpool House to say, you know, this kid's going to be a star. He's going to open his own place and it's going to... Um, yeah, good. kind of, but it, a dishwasher, a clever dishwasher can become sous chef within a year if he plays his cards right, is interested, keeps up on his studies and makes it happen, you know. I've had people stay on appetizers for eight years, just show no ambition, they're just happy making salads, you know. But then I have people that have walked in as bus, you know, as uh, bus boys that have become sous chefs. Uh, the system works that way, where once you figure out how the restaurant works and you play your cards right, you and you do your studies and you do your reading and you practice your skills, you will you will become whatever you want to become within the restaurant. You can build your dream job inside of my company. I don't do that for you. It's not like corporate structure, you know. One thing that I like about when, you, when you're on social media or when I've seen you, you and Fred in, in interviews is you really don't seem to have much of an interest in the cult of personality that seems to follow some of the higher end restaurants in, in, in North America or the world. You guys seem to just want your, your, your work to do the talking. Is that an accurate assessment? I think to be self-effacing is the, my, the right way to be. Uh, uh, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm not comfortable by braggadocio. Uh, listen, we have a job. We're family people. Go to the job. We're not curing cancer. We're not, you know, sometimes chefs like are like get a little bit precious and a little bit like, you know, holier than thou. But at the end of the day, what are you doing? You know, you're opening bottles of wine that somebody else made, and you're you're clever with salmon. <laughs> you know, like it's like you're not you're not doing anything. You know, really. And in the last few years, and I know you won't say so, but I think the rise of the Joe Beefs of the world and the Liverpool Houses of the world contributed to this, but Montreal had been on fire in terms of the restaurant. Oh, it's people discovering Montreal. You know, it's not even about the chef. This is the best dining city in North America because of the people that live here. I practice my sport on the best playing field in North America. My clients eat liver, kidneys, rabbit, duck, quails, any way that I decide to make them. I cook whatever I want, and I have a, a very receptive audience to fennel, cardoons, celery root, in any way that we, like, we sell it all and have a, a an amazing, open-minded clientele. We have the best wine drinkers in per capita North America, absolutely. Oh, we serve 95% weird, three-legged goat, natural wines. I love my clientele. I can't give away Cabernet Sauvignon from California for free to my guests. They're not interested. They're super, super advanced diners. That's why Pied de Cochon exists. That's why L'Express is a, a diamond in North America. That's why Le Mayac is packed, you know, and everybody's eating blood pudding. Uh, New York's not like that, you know. New York's shiny fancy, rich designer restaurants, but everybody's eating steak, scallops, white fish, beef. It's a giant steakhouse. So is everywhere else. We have a melting pot of cultures that permits us to practice French cooking, at least the way we do in our restaurant, and the most fertile ground in North America. Without a question of it, that we could never take Joe Beef to San Francisco and do what we do. Never. Never in Chicago, never in New York City, never in Miami. I serve horse, like, but like the tongue, like not like everything. And people, and 
little girls and men and people of all ages and different cultures from Montreal, Montrealers, eat it. And they don't go like, oh my God, this is horse. Oh my God. And taking pictures. You know, they're not. They're just like, oh, horse. Delicious. Thank you. <laughs> the best. Like, you know, this is the best. These are the best people. David, thanks for having brunch. I really it's appreciate it. It's my pleasure, it. man. Thank you so much thanks. for inviting me to brunch. No problem. Anytime. <laughs>